begin speaking to the crowds at the temple. He was continuing his teaching. The teaching that had caused division among not only the people, but the leaders of the people, the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus had said that if you come to Me and believe, out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. And He said this about the Spirit. And this, these teachings, and if you read in other places in the Gospels, and even later here in the next few verses that we didn't get to, people would exclaim, who is this man? He teaches as one who has authority. He doesn't speak like other men. He teaches the things of God in a way that Yes, we, we do hear them, but it is authoritative. He, he doesn't refer back to other rabbis or other men to support Him. If you remember that when they confronted Jesus before, He says, I'm only doing what I see the Father do. He has said that I'm doing the work that the Father, that God has sent me to do. In other places in the Gospel, in Matthew's Gospel, when the scribes and Pharisees came to Him and they questioned Him, Jesus would say things like, have you not read what God spoke to your fathers? He put Scripture, the Old Testament writings, as the very Word of God. Have you not read what God spoke? And here He has said that out of your hearts will flow rivers of living water. And we spoke of how the living water is the blessings of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit that would well up and flow out of those who have come to Christ in faith. And these people, when they heard these words, they made a proclamation. They said, this is the prophet And others said, this is the Christ. Now how many Christians today have taken the time to understand what it meant when the people said, this is the prophet? There had been prophets throughout Israel's history. There are what we call the minor prophets, and sometimes we have difficulty in pronouncing their names. You have Obadiah and Habakkuk, Zephaniah and Haggai, Nahum. We have what we call the major prophets. It's not that they are major, that their works are more important. It's that their writings were longer. We have Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. We have Samuel, who was called a prophet. There have been prophets given to God's people from the beginning of time. These prophets would speak on behalf of God to the people. A prophet speaks to the people from God. He tells them what God has to say. He stands between God and the people. And he communicates God's Word to them in a way that they can understand. And Jews at this time, and even today, there was one prophet that they revered more than any other prophet. There was one prophet that would be considered to stand head and shoulders above every other prophet. And that was Moses. Now why would Moses be so acknowledged and honored? Well, we have an entire covenant that we named after him. It's the Mosaic Covenant. He was the prophet and the leader of the people as they left Egypt. And in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 18 and verse 15, while Moses, this prophet that was esteemed above all the others that had come before him and that would come after him, he said this, 
the Lord your God, Yahweh, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God in horror about the day of the assembly when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I will, I myself will require it of him. The Jewish people, the Israelites, from the time of Moses until the time of Christ were looking forward to Yahweh, sending them the prophet that would be greater than Moses. And we had people here saying, this is that prophet. This is the Christ. And Christ is the New Testament equivalent of the Old Testament Messiah. It means the Anointed One. The One anointed by Yahweh. The Messiah was often in the Old Testament and rightly so equated with the coming King who would sit upon the throne of David. The Messiah would be the deliverer of God's people. And the prophet that would come would be the one who would speak the words of God directly to the people that would lead them to salvation. Moses was a type of Christ in the Old Testament. When we take analogies and types and shadows, we can't press them too far. All analogies will break down if you push them far enough. But they are useful for us and God has placed them in Scriptures to help us understand the movement of redemptive history. As God was bringing to fruition His plan of salvation. That God has not left us without a voice. In Hebrews chapter 1 it says, in, many, in times past and in many ways, God has spoken to us. But in these last days, He has spoken to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the authoritative Word of God. But when we look back to Moses and we, we see Him as a type of Christ, I think it would behoove us to take just a, a few moments here tonight to see why that would be important. How does that correlate to Christ and what Christ's mission was? Well, if you remember the story of Moses, he was born in Egypt to a Hebrew family at a time when Pharaoh was seeking to kill all the male Hebrew children. But his mother had him and hid him in a basket and had him placed in the Nile. At Jesus' birth, there was an evil King Herod. In order to keep this king from arriving on the scene, gave a proclamation that all of the children born in and around Bethlehem, two years and under, should be killed. So both Moses and Jesus entered into this world under trying circumstances, with their lives in danger, with men of great power whose blackened and evil hearts were seeking 
to destroy them. And they both had the hand of God upon them to protect them. And though Jesus Himself was very God of very God, the Father still watched over Him. And He guided His steps. Moses, having grown up and been adopted by Pharaoh's daughter and growing up in the courts of Egypt would have been lavished with every good thing. But Moses left that glory and honor Jesus Christ left the glories of heaven where He was forever at the right hand of the Father. And He humbled Himself and became a servant. And He took on flesh. And He dwelt among us. And He came from the glories of heaven and He dwelt in this wilderness of sin upon this earth. In the Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6, we can read that Moses was set apart for ministry. And starting in verse 4, it said, When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, and that is the burning bush, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. And then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. There was a calling forth to ministry of Moses. See, God uses men in ways that they never expect. Moses, who had grown up in Pharaoh's household, with the riches of Egypt. He, he left Egypt under trying circumstances. He had killed an Egyptian who was beating a Hebrew slave. And the next day when he tried to separate a fight between two Hebrews, one of them said, who are you that you are Lord over us? Are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? And Moses got scared and he fled into the wilderness. Jesus went into the wilderness voluntarily. The Father sent him and he went. But they were both called and set apart for ministry. Jesus at his baptism when he stepped into the waters and John the Baptist said, Who am I to baptize you? You should be the one baptizing me. I am unworthy to unstrap your sandals. And Jesus replied and He said, Do this so that all righteousness may be fulfilled. And after He was baptized, as He was coming up out of the water, there was a voice from heaven saying, This is My beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And they could see the Spirit descending as a dove and hovering over Jesus. And there are many who think at that time and according to the Scriptures that Jesus began His public ministry. That He was set apart for service to His Father. And just like Moses, He was called to do a work. And what was that work? As you see, Moses' life was a as we've already said, a type of Christ. 
He was to lead God's people. But what was He to lead them from and what was He to lead them to? You see, the Hebrew people had been in Egypt for 430 years. And they had come under bondage and slavery. In chapter 3 and verse 7 of Exodus, And then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. See, Moses was set apart and tasked with the work of leading God's people out of bondage. Out of slavery. Out of the place of darkness and pagan worship. They were in a place they could not get out of by their own efforts. They were slaves to Pharaoh. They were working for wages that they would never receive. And they lived their lives as servants of a master who did not care for them and only used them. How are we like those people? Those who are apart from Christ in this world are slaves. We are in bondage to sin and death. In Galatians 4, 3, it says we are in bondage to this world. Romans 6.20, we are slaves of sin. We are in a place that we cannot free ourselves from. We are tasked with a job that will kill us. And we go about that with joy. We are shackled and in darkness. Our sin blinds us, but we still serve it. Satan, the God of this world, leads us. And we follow Him. And we listen to the voices of this world that whisper in our ear that we do not need a Savior. We do not need to be liberated from the condition that we are in. Until the burden becomes too great to bear it. And God's people, when they are beaten and bloody, and His children who are enslaved and have not yet been set free, they call out to Him. God hears from heaven and He says, I have heard the cries of my people. And God makes demands and he sets conditions and he says this is what must be done and he sent Moses as a deliverer to go back to Egypt to tell Pharaoh Yahweh God has said to let my people go that they may worship me in the wilderness and Moses demands release of God's people. 
in Exodus 6, 6. We'll begin at 3. Said The Lord was speaking. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves. And I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will deliver you from slavery to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I I am the Lord your God who has brought you from under the burdens of the Egyptians. See, God sent His leader, His prophet, to lead His people out of slavery. But theirs, at that time, was only an earthly slavery. Moses did not lead them from sin. Not in the way that Christ would lead His people. Because you see, God sent His Son into this world to destroy the works of the devil. To defeat every enemy of God that held His people in bondage. Jesus came into this world to free us from death. He came to be the light of the world, to lead us out of the darkness. There are more similarities between Moses and Christ. If you remember, what was the last plague? that was visited upon Egypt and upon Pharaoh. <clears throat> the death of the firstborn. Many people say, that cannot be God. The God of the Old Testament must be different from the God of the New Testament. Now God, who is God of both Testaments, the God of all creation, the One who spoke the worlds into existence, is a God of justice and holiness and righteousness. And those who sin against Him can expect to be judged by Him. And Pharaoh, the epitome of evil in the world at that time, the most powerful man in the world, Refused to let this group of Hebrews worship God. And God had told Moses back in chapter 4, He says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not release my people. There are other verses that state that Pharaoh hardened his own heart and they are both true. That God orchestrated the circumstances by which Pharaoh's heart was hardened. But if we read in the New Testament, in Romans chapter 9, Paul explaining and speaking on this very subject said, speaking on behalf of God said, I have raised up Pharaoh for this very purpose that my might and my power may be shown in him. And Paul goes on to write that God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will harden whom I will harden. 
And the only way to be set free from slavery in Egypt was for the firstborn to die. The only way for people today to be set free from the bondage of sin. The only way for any person at any time in all of history to be set free was for the firstborn to die. That firstborn is Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Who died to take away the sins of the world. Just like John the Baptist standing on the Jordan River pointed to Christ and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There had to be a death to free us. There had to be one who stood in our place. And that was the death of Jesus Christ. The Passover. You remember the night before the death angel was to come, Moses went to the people of Israel and he said, you better do this. You better take a lamb that is without blemish and you're going to sacrifice this lamb and you're going to take the blood and you're going to put it on the doorpost and above the door. And you're going to roast this lamb and you're going to eat it. And you're going to eat it with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. But the blood covered the people who believed the words of Moses. So that when the death angel passed through the land, taking the firstborn of every Egyptian, from the Pharaoh to the poorest, all of their livestock, the firstborn died. but not among the Hebrews who were covered by the blood. Who ate the unleavened bread to symbolize that there was no sin in their house. And who ate the bitter herbs as a symbol of the bondage and the bitterness of their slavery. And Moses had also told them to eat this meal. To have your belt upon your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand to be ready to go when I call you out. This firstborn that covers us with His blood. Hebrews 1.6 says, I will be to Him a Father and He shall be to me a Son. Colossians 1.15, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Firstborn does not mean the firstborn in a line of future sons. It means the preeminent one, the, the one to whom all rights is given. And in Christ, we have everything that He has secured for us. In Exodus 14 and 13. We can read. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. That's a tough one. You ever notice how we always want to help God with our salvation? The Israelites were the same way. God, they had sat through and watched all the plagues that God had brought upon Pharaoh and the Egyptians. They had been spared from every plague. 
God had delivered them from slavery and He was leading them out and they came to the Red Sea. They immediately began to grumble and complain and said, why didn't you leave us in Egypt to die? Why did you bring us out here to die? How many of us today in the church do the same thing? That God Almighty has saved us, delivered us from our sins, set us free, adopted us into His family. We are members of the household of God. And the first time that we face an obstacle, God, why did you ever bring me here? God, it would have been better if I had died back there. And then God just says, yeah, but then I couldn't have showed my power and my glory. And I could not have saved the people for myself. But we often look at the Israelites and say, man, what a dumb people they are. They are so ungrateful. I doubt we'd have made it as far as they did. But notice what Moses says, do not be afraid. Because you see, it is Christ who fights for us. We can never stand alone against the world and the devil in our own strength. We can't do it. It is Christ who stands for us. It is Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who has bought us from the slave market and who will fight for us. If you read in James, it says, humble yourselves before God. The first thing that we do is humble ourselves before God, and then we resist the devil, and he will flee from us. But we humble ourselves before God and acknowledge that it is only through Him that we can do anything. The Lord will fight for you. And I like how the New King James puts it. It says, you shall hold your peace. It sort of sounds like how we say things in the South at times. We say, you better hold your tongue, boy. Hold your peace. Don't say anything else. Stand here and watch the salvation of God. As if you need more proof that God is fighting for you. Stand here and watch the salvation of Yahweh. In 1 Thessalonians 5.9 It says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts 13, 47, he says, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. See, Jesus Christ is the light that lights the way. He was the cloud that went before the Israelites during the day that led them. And He was the cloud of fire that stood between the Egyptians and the people here this day. I think sometimes we just need to shut our mouths and acknowledge God and then do what He commands. In Exodus 15.22, the the Israelites, they've come through the Red Sea. They, They are moving towards Mount Sinai. And they never... Learn, and they complain against Moses the prophet that has delivered them under the power of God from Egypt. And, and they came to the bitter waters of Mar. And these waters couldn't be drunk. They were no good. And in verse 25 it says there was a tree cast into the bitter waters. And the waters were made sweet. There is a tree that is cast into the bitter waters of our lives. As Jesus Christ, the greater prophet, 
that God rose up for us. He hung upon this tree. And when that tree touches the bitter waters of our lives, they are made sweet. In Romans 3.14, it speaks of the unbeliever. It says, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. In James 3, it says, does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Because you see, before Christ, we are nothing but bitter. And then the cross and the sacrifice of the cross is cast into the bitter waters of our lives. And we become a sweet savor before our God. And we are changed from bitterness to goodness. Not our goodness, but the goodness of Christ. In Exodus 16 and 4, the people once again started complaining to Moses, their deliverer. And they said, Moses, we are hungry. You have brought us into the wilderness to die. Better to remain slaves in Egypt than where we had leeks and garlics and things to eat. We would rather serve as slaves and to eat the crumbs that the world has to offer than to serve you and to depend upon you. And in 1615, Moses said, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. And it's manna. And manna actually means, what is it? So every time they said, gather manna, you're saying, gather, what is it? Because it pointed to, guess who? Jesus Christ. The bread that has come down from heaven. He says, I am the bread of life. In John 6.49, He said, Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. And Jesus told him, If you eat this bread, you'll never die. Moses gave them bread that subsisted for but a while. It only kept them alive for a short time. Jesus Christ, the prophet that came after Moses, gives us bread that leads to eternal life. In Exodus 17 and 6, the people again were complaining. They were out of water again. And God told Moses to take your staff and go strike the rock. And out of the rock came living water. And we have read about this living water in John chapter 4 with Jesus at the woman in the well where He said, if you drink of this water that I have to give you, you will never thirst again. And out of you will flow rivers of living water. The woman said, where do I get this water? And Jesus said, if you knew who you were speaking to, you wouldn't have to ask where you could get this water. Because in 1 Corinthians 10, 14, Paul tells us that the rock that followed the Israelites in the wilderness was Christ. And out of Christ comes living water. In John 7, 38, we have just in the last few weeks, in the last couple weeks, it says, if you come to me and believe, out of your belly will flow. Out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. Christ is the great prophet from whence these living waters come that quenches all of our thirst. Our spiritual thirst that drives us to seek more of Him. That once you have gotten a taste of this water, nothing in this world will ever satisfy. 
It quenches the longing of our soul. And it bubbles up and flows from us. In Exodus 19, God told Moses that He would raise up a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That was in the near context fulfilled in the nation of Israel. It was ultimately fulfilled in Christ. In 1 Peter 2, 5-9, Peter said, I will make you a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. In Christ, this greater prophet, we are the priest of God's kingdom. Not priest in the manner of the Levitical priesthood where we continually take sacrifices of animals, of bulls and goats before our God. But we offer sacrifices of praise. We are living sacrifices. And we offer up to God the praise of our lips for delivering us from the bondage of sin. In Exodus 20, it begins, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the household of slavery. And then the Ten Commandments are given. The basis of all of God's law under the Mosaic Covenant. It is a re-stipulation of the moral law that has been given to all people at all times. Because contrary to what people think, what any pagan or atheist or unbeliever thinks, you have no right to worship false gods. You have the freedom as a creature to rebel against Yahweh. But you do not have that right. Moses was the great lawgiver of the Israelite nation. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not have any idols or carved images of anything in heaven above or earth beneath. You shall not worship or bow down before them. You shall not take the Lord your God's name in vain. You shall not blaspheme the name of God. And contrary to popular opinion, that is not simply saying GD or using Jesus Christ as a swear word. It is attributing to God words that He has not said. If I stood here before you today and I said, Thus saith the Lord, you shall not eat pickles for the remainder of your life. I am taking God's name in vain. I am speaking on God's behalf things that He has never said. And they continue with the Ten Commandments. It says, Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. For in six days the Lord your God created the heavens and the earth and everything in it, the things in the sky and the things in the sea and the things on the land. Therefore you shall keep it holy. For in six days God created on the seventh. He rested. And then we have, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, you shall honor your father and mother, you shall not bear false witness. Moses recorded these laws given to him by God. And Jesus says, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. In Romans chapter 8, Paul writes that God doing 
what the law could not through the weakness of our sinful flesh sent His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Fulfilling the law in us. In Romans earlier, Paul said that we do not abrogate or we do not end the law, but through faith we fulfill the law. Moses was the lawgiver from Mount Sinai. Jesus is the lawgiver from heaven on high. In Matthew 28, 19, in the Great Commission, and most of us will be familiar with this, Jesus said, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. He is the prophet that was to come. And he says, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them not just His commandments, because we often leave out a word there. And it's easy to leave out. Yes, we are to teach the commandments of Jesus. He says, teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. And the commandments of Christ are easy, aren't they? He said the whole law can be summarized this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. Now let's just take a real quick moment to think about that. (coughs) Number one, you've never loved the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you've never loved your neighbor as yourself. But do you notice any similarities between those two laws and what we just went over in the Ten Commandments? Can you think of a better way to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to not have other gods? Or to keep His name holy? And to not have idols? Can you think of a better way to love your neighbor than... Number one, not to murder him. Number two, not to steal from him. Number two, not to bear walk, or three or four or whatever number we own now, not to bear false witness against him. Don't commit adultery with his wife. Don't covet his stuff, his mule or his donkey. Do you think the commands that Jesus gave have any resemblance to to the commands that God gave to Moses. In Romans 13, when Paul is reciting love is the fulfillment of the law, and he says to love your neighbor as yourself, he then lists two or three of those commandments, just as I did here. He said, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness. But the prophet who was to come didn't just give us laws like Moses did. See, Moses gave us these laws that pointed to this prophet. Paul wrote in Galatians that the law was a schoolmaster that was to lead us to Christ. The laws written upon tablets and upon on the scrolls of the Old Testament were the way that God showed us that we had a need of a Savior. That we were in bondage and slaves. And then Christ came and fulfilled those laws on our behalf. He paid the debt that we could not and He carried that debt to the cross. And He made a way for us where there was no way. Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. The Savior who died upon a sinner's cross. Who lived a perfect life 
did so that we could come to the Father. It is by His blood that we are reconciled. It is by His sacrifice that we are made right. It is by His resurrection that we are given life. And it is through faith in Him that we are justified before God. The only way to salvation is through Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Have you repented today? Are you in the household of God? Adopted into His family? Washed in the blood of Christ? Have you been forgiven of your sins? Have you come to Him with the empty hand of faith? Are you at peace with God Almighty? If not, today is the day of salvation. Be silent and realize that Jesus Christ has already won the battle for you. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we once again thank you for the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. We thank You that You fulfilled Your promise to raise up a prophet. And Lord, that through Him that we hear Your Word. And that through Your Spirit we obey what He says. Father, we thank You that You have won the fight for us that you redeemed us from the bondage of sin and death. That you have washed us from the filth of this world. That you have brought us and set us at your table. Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.